I first heard about it on the BBC News going home um, and five o'clock news and they talked about this new discovery which is going to change the world of particle physics and how we understand the universe and I'm going oh and they talked about the uh, how the electron is a perfect sphere and I'm thinking well what, what experiment is this it's and gradually as they talked a little bit more I realized it's I knew what the experiment was and I even know the people who have done it they were my colleagues in Sussex and so uh, I know Johnny Hudson and Ed Hines very well and Ben Sauer and so it was really great to hear about the experiment I'd never thought about it as being the electron is a sphere I'd thought about it as the electron dipole moment somehow I don't think if they'd have talked about the electric dipole moment of the electron that might not have made the BBC news I, I can't give you the heavy experimental details because it's too complicated for a theorist like myself but I can tell you some of the background First of all, why, why say the electron is a, a sphere? When we, we think of the electron actually as a fundamental particle, it's one of the building blocks of, 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 of uh, the standard model. And normally you think of that as a point-like object. So what does it mean to say it's a sphere? And I think what they're really talking about is the charge. The electron's got a charge, uh, an electric charge. And, and they're talking about the distribution of that charge. They've measured it to be almost spherical. And in fact, to show the precision of their experiment, they've demonstrated that that distribution, if, if they could scale it up to the size of the solar system, then it would be a sphere to within a hair's breadth. They could measure a deviation of a hair's width. So a sphere the size of the solar system, they could measure a deviation of that charge distribution of a hair's width it turns out that the, that distribution of the charge around the electron is, is, is really important in understanding the nature of the matter, antimatter asymmetry, the fact that we live in a universe made up mainly of matter, very little antimatter around, and yet we believe in the early universe they were created in equal amounts. So what has happened? And the, by finding this, a deviation of, of this charge from this, the perfectly spherical charge, you, we would hopefully gain some information about this origin of this matter antimatter asymmetry. So let me step back before I go into those details and perhaps just talk a little bit about the, what, what it means to be not spherical. So, so a spherical distribution of charge, basically the way I think about it anyway, is that if you happen to have a, a, a detector that could pick up charge, could measure charge, then if, if my electron is here then the detector would pick up an equal amount of charge on this side as it would on this side, as it would up and down and all the way around it would be perfectly spherical. It wouldn't see any uh, preferential distribution of charge. That's called a monopole by the way where, it, where it's equally distributed like that, a spherical distribution. Now the next thing you can do, you can, if you want to distort this charge, is the next simplest one is called a dipole. And uh, we're used to dipoles at school, we're used to dipoles, magnetic dipoles, a bar magnet, right, has a south pole and a north pole. And we're used to that in, in magnetic uh, cases, but it also exists in the electric case. If I had a positive electric charge and a negative electric charge, then the dipole would be, and put them close to one another, the dipole would be a line that goes from the negative to the positive charge. Right, so this is, so the electron's only got a negative charge. So it turns out that you don't have to have a positive and a negative charge to have a, have a, a dipole. You just need to have a, a distribution of the charge which is not spherical. So if, for example, I, I distorted this sphere, so I made it so that it may be more like a, a, um, a raindrop, okay, which has got a, bul a bulgous end at one bit and a narrow end at the other. So there's more charge over here and less charge over here, then I would have a dipole going from, from one, one part to the other part. That's what they're looking for. That's what this experiment is looking for with the electron. They're looking for this asymmetry in the charge. And things that cause this asymmetry are the interaction of the electron with the other particles. Now the impact of it, okay, so that's the first thing you do, that you, they don't see this deviation. What's its impact? Well, who cares, right? The, the reason why it's important is that, or one reason why it's important, is that the, if something's got an electric dipole moment, if the electron has an electric dipole moment, that breaks 
something called uh, time reversal symmetry. Okay, so what does that mean? What time, what time reversal symmetry means is if you would rewound the, the, uh, the film, went backwards in time, you would see exactly the same as if you were going forwards in time. The presence of the electric dipole moment means that you violate that time reversal symmetry. It's no longer symmetric in time. That has a knock-on effect because there are, there's a, a property in particle physics which we believe is, re, is symmetric and that's the, the product of the charge times the parity. The parity is when you move from plus x to minus x times the time. So these three things together, CPT it's called, CPT symmetry we believe holds. If you break the T symmetry, that means you must also break the CP bit because together they hold. Okay, so now let me put the T symmetry aside. It's getting a bit complicated to hang in there. Why is the CP symmetry, why does that need to be broken? A fantastic physicist called Andrei Sakharov demonstrated that in order to account for the matter, antimatter asymmetry in the universe, we need to break CP violation. We need to have CP violation. We need to break that asymmetry, that symmetry, sorry, between charge and parity in order to account for the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe, which is what we observe. So, if I go back then, remember what I said, the, the observation of an electron, electric dipole moment of the electron would imply that you've broken T-symmetry. If you've broken T-symmetry, that implies you've broken CP-symmetry. So if you've broken CP-symmetry, and you've, it means you're beginning to understand the origin of the matter-antimatter asymmetry. So the measurement of this little quantity, which is so far not deviating from zero, but if it was to be measured, and when it's measured, then it's telling you something about the origin of matter-antimatter asymmetry, which is one of the big fundamental questions in particle physics. So that's one of the key reasons why it's such an important experiment. When the experiment's finished and it's done perfectly, mm -hmm. right. is a sphere the best result or is not quite a sphere the best result? Not quite a sphere. It has to be not quite a sphere. We know that it's not quite a sphere uh, because even in the, the standard model of particle physics that, that is already so well understood and explains many of the properties of particles and interactions, we know that there's already a mechanism in there which will create the electric dipole moment of the electron. It's just that it creates it at such a small level that actually it's not good enough to account for the matter-antimatter asymmetry. It breaks T violation, T symmetry, by such a small amount that it can't account for it. So we need something bigger. So we expect, that we expect it to be there. If it's not there, then something quite dramatic is happening in our understanding of the particle physics, and it, that may happen. And we might have to go back and to the drawing board and start that bit again. But so far, uh, the, the, the bounds are getting such that it's still eating into many of the particle physics models, but it hasn't gone all the way through them. So that it's, it's ruling out some of them, but it, there's still a whole load left. And of course, theorists being theorists, they'll come up with some ingenious mechanism which will explain why they've not seen it. But the idea is you will see it. The media has been portraying electrons now as the most spherical objects in the universe. Does that sound fair to you? In terms of the charge, yes, yeah. I still like to think of them as these point-like objects that, uh, you know, there is a bound on the size of the electron, right? You, from, from particle collisions, you put a bound on the actual physical size. And that bound is about, is the electron is less than 10 to the minus 18 meters. Just to remind you, the size of an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters, an angstrom. The size of the nucleus of the atom is about 10 to the minus 15 meters. That's a Fermi. So the size of the electron has been bounded. No one's seen a physical, you know, point-like object that you could say, that's the electron. You see the distribution of the charge. And the, so the bound on the size, of the, the actual size, is, is um, 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's, so it's less than that. So what we're looking at here is the, the charge distribution. And, and yeah, that's beautifully spherical. Amazing experiment. Absolutely amazing. It's still way off. The, the, the experiment, in, in, in terms of units, it, it measures a, a, a deviation, an electric dipole moment of a, well, it, it's bounding it to be less than 10 to the minus 28. It's called E centimeters, electron charge times centimeters. The prediction from the standard model
really small. It's about 10 to the minus 39. It's still 10 orders of magnitude away. So if it ever reached down that level, then we've got to ask some serious questions of where did the asymmetry of the matter, antimatter asymmetry of the universe come from? And that would be that would be like scaling, probably like scaling the this, if it went down to that size, in other words, if they didn't detect an electric dipole moment until you were down there, assuming they, they probably could never reach that degree of sensitivity anyway, but it would be like scaling the system up to something like the galaxy size and having a hair's width. Um, and then, then we'd be struggling to explain the matter antimatter, but hopefully they'll see it. In this theory, the universe is a continuum based on a universal process of energy exchange we have an interactive process between the light photon and the electron probability cloud of the atoms. This process forms the movement of positive and negative charge, breaking the spherical symmetry, forming the imperfect asymmetry or broken symmetry of everyday life. We see and feel this process as the passage of time with each photon-electron coupling, or dipole moment, only occurring once, forming an uncertain future. The continuous annihilation of antimatter represents the past, at the smallest scale of the process that forms a continuum of time, with the spontaneous absorption and emission of light, represented by the quantum wave particle function, or probability function of quantum mechanics. In such a theory, the wave-particle duality of light and matter in the form of electrons is forming a blank canvas that we can interact with, forming the possible into the actual. Thanks for watching. Please share and subscribe. It will help the promotion of this theory.